Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel House Planty Goodness and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it around me, it's tropical house plants. So today's video is going to be a different video, a different type of video. So this will be more all the tips and tricks that I know of in terms of watering your plants properly and it might seem like a really basic topic and some of these things that I'm going to talk about that I do might seem a bit extreme to some people but I will talk through why I do them and then you can make up your mind as to what you want to do when it comes to watering your own plants. I am not saying by any stretch of the imagination that this is the right way and what you might be doing is the wrong way but this is just my way of doing it and hopefully it might help some people think about watering the plants slightly differently. There will be some honourable mentions when it comes to pond because I do have quite a few of my plants in pond at the moment and yeah it will be more kind of talking some of the basics and maybe some of the more advanced things to bear in mind. So without further ado let's go into one of the most basic things that I can think of that hopefully most people are doing already within their collections and that is when watering in pots. So when watering in pots, and I cannot stress this enough, and hopefully most of you will probably be aware of this at the moment, is make sure that there is drainage holes. And let me be clear about this, this is all house plants. All plants that you will generally put into a pot of any variety. If you get pots that are like these, that are more decorative, and there isn't a hole or a drainage hole at the bottom, you can still use them if you want it to look a bit more pretty. Done. You would have a plant, it's still in a decorative pot. The pot itself, because it doesn't have a hole, also works as a bit of a drip tray. So you don't even need to have unsightly drip trays. It will be in there. The one thing I will give as a bit of advice with this is make sure that when you're watering, you let the water fully drain out before you put it back into the drip tray. Because if you haven't, what will happen is you're creating a bit of a swamp situation in there and that will harm your roots because essentially it will be sitting in boggy water. So bear that in mind. And I know some people might come to me and say, well, what about carnivorous plants that are used to growing in bogs? What about them? Do they still need drainage holes? Yes, they still need drainage holes. The difference is that then you would use either the cash po and still have water at the bottom of it, or you'd have a drip tray or any form of tray with some water sitting on it. But it's always best to have drainage holes because even with the carnivorous plants there might be a point where you're going to want to change a bit of that water and run some fresh water through it especially if there's any form of bacteria or any kind of fungus gnats growing in it that's specifically about the carnivorous plants that are used to growing into bogs anything else everything really needs to be in a pot with drainage holes you can still get terracotta pots as well and even some decorative pots with a drainage hole at the bottom do that I cannot tell you how much my heart breaks every time, especially, and I don't know why they keep insisting on doing this for succulents and cactuses where there is, they sell plants in decorative pots, not even in a plastic pot within a decorative pot, directly in a decorative pot without a hole in it. For the average person when they're first starting, that is a recipe for failure because the only way that you're going to be able to make sure that there isn't water sitting at the bo bottom of a decorative pot without a hole is to somehow cover your hand and obviously if it's a cactus you might end up with thorns in your hands and tip it out and even then there's no guarantee that there isn't still some water in the soil that will eventually drop down to the bottom. So save yourself some heartache, just get or just generally have your plants in pots with drainage holes. Now moving on to the next topic. The next topic I want to talk about is kind of how you would water around the plant and for demonstration purposes, I've got a trusty pint, plastic pint glass that I use a lot of the times for propagating in pond. And I thought with pond it'd be a bit easier to see. And say the stick, janky support stick, on its little lonesome at the moment, just because it'll be easier to kind of demonstrate what I want to say, is make sure when you're watering, you water all around the plant, not just in one minute area because especially if you've got it in any form of soil mix, it might not permeate, that water might not permeate around the entire pot, especially if there's big roots in there and everything like that. Just always make sure that you're watering entirely around the plant. And the other big thing 
and I will kind of put a drip tray on this so you might be able to see what I'm going to like show now is obviously you would go with a watering can and you would go all around and you should be able to see the water is kind of trickling through the entirety of that pond going around. And the other big thing, big, big thing is make sure that you lift and tilt whatever pot, whether it's in pond or whether or not it's a soil mix, because essentially I think you're disrupting where the water level will sit. Because if you just take it out after you've thoroughly watered it, and by thoroughly watering, I think this is the biggest one out there, make sure that whatever you're watering, there is water coming through down the bottom of it. And if you tilt it, it kind of disrupts that water level and it means that you don't get water pooling at the bottom. Because if you don't do that, I find there might be quite a bit of water left at the very bottom of the pot right there. And you put it back in and it could still cause some issues to your plants. Coming back to the thoroughly watering, this is for every plant, every single plant, even the ones that are meant to have slightly more moisture in the soil, especially for the plants that are meant to dry out fully. The only addendum that I want to say when it comes to plants that want to dry out fully is that you make sure sometimes you'll get, and I'm trying to think if I've got it. Ah, I've got one I can show you. Unfortunately, this is something that died off. It does happen. I also kill plants, but you might be able to see, and I'm sorry for the really crusty dusty uh, state of this pot, but you might be able to see that that soil is pulling away from the sides of the pot. And if I try to lift it, you can see it's coming out as a clump. It's entirely dry. And what that will mean, depending on what media you're using, sometimes when a media is specifically potting soil that has uh, moss in it, basically, peat moss, is that it will compact and it will become a bit of a brick. It kind of almost cements itself together, which means what happens when you fully water it and you'll still see the water gush out at the bottom very, very quickly, and that's your sign that something might be wrong as well, is that that water is just basically, let me show you, it's essentially what it's doing is it's basically just running over the sides. It's not actually permeating the inside of the soil where a lot of the roots are. So that is a bigger issue. Now, what you can do is either water really, really slowly and let it soak up a bit of water and then come back a few minutes later and water a bit more and then that will suck up a bit more of the water and eventually you should start seeing the water that throughout this whole process you'll see water coming out quite quickly but the more you water it and you can see it's kind of like absorbing the water like a sponge you'll see that the water trickling out will become slower it won't just gush out really quickly so that's a good way of doing it the other way that you can do this especially if it's become a <laughs> a brick is pop it into a saucer of water until about halfway, I would say. Leave it in there for 10 to 20 minutes. Obviously, remember to take it out and then drain it the way that you would normally do. But what it will do is it will start sucking up the water from the down up. And that's why this method is called bottom watering. A lot of people do bottom watering. I used to do it for the first year, year and a half of having plants. I just have too many plants to be able to do that now. <laughs> but... Um, that is a way of kind of rehydrating a media that has become a solid block, basically. I will say with my Aroid mix, and again, I'll put a video up here, link to you can see the video of how I do my Aroid mix. I have never had that compaction because it's very, very airy and it's got a lot of particles in it that break up the soil. Not to say that my Aroid mix is any better than anybody else's, but the more aeration you put into it, the less likely it is that it's gonna clump up like that. Sometimes when you get this, a lot of the times you'll get it with succulents and cactuses, especially with cactuses. If you have stopped watering for the winter, that first water might be a bit tricky like this. So even a cactus, you can sit it in water for a good 10, 20 minutes so it can absorb all that moisture. Definitely make sure that you're tipping it out so you can get all the water out of the soil mix, especially if it's a cactus succulent, and then put it back to where it needs to be with some nice bright light in the summer. And it will thank you. It will kind of reconstitute that soil to a certain bit. If you see that that is happening all the time, it might be a chance or a time that you might want to swap out the soil and maybe add some more soil in just to kind of keep that as kind of loose as you possibly can. But even a good cactus mix, if it's got loads of sand in it, it shouldn't clump together that much. 
Moving on to things like self-watering for soil. So you can get little ceramic spikes like this, where you can attach a water bottle at the top and stick it in some soil. I would advise against this, unless it might be like something like a garden plant, basically, that's in the soil. Because what will happen is the water is quite full at the very top. I find that these times, sometimes that water pressure of that level of water trying to escape will just mean that, that water will come out slowly, it won't gush out altogether, but it, there is a chance that it might flood your plant, especially if it's in a saucer as well. It might just have that water pooling at the end. These are a better option, although they can be quite tricky to use. And I'll bring this in a bit closer so you might be able to see it. I'll also unattach it. But essentially, these are called hydro spikes. And you can see there is one end that you would put into a vessel of water. And the other side is another one of those ceramic containers, a vasey kind of thing. I don't know what it's described, spike. Uh, you would fill that in with water at the very top. You would submerge this in water for 20 to 30 minutes and this whole thing in water to make sure that all the water is through the tube because they don't tell you that in the instructions. And then whilst it's underwater, attached these two things together, keep this in the water and then spike it into your plant. The other thing to remember with this is the water vessel and this little element here, and you might want to put like a fishing weight or something at the bottom just to keep it in because it will float otherwise, needs to be lower than where your plants, where the soil is. So if I'm putting this here and I'm putting it in there, I would need to have this lower basically because it's going against gravity, it's going through capillary action because essentially when this starts drying out, it will suck up more of the water and it will come up from that water vessel. These things are a gold mine. They can be a bit tricky to set up. Now, the honorable mention for pond when it comes to self-watering, and I know a lot of people love the concept of pond because of the self-watering element. A few things that I've learned, and I don't actually have any example that I can show you. Oh, maybe I do. Give me a sec. So this might look a bit crusty and dusty. This is my Anthurium bulatus, I think it is. There's also another word for it, which I can never remember. But um, Nikki from Plants, Pots and Whatnots was posting about this on her Instagram. And I'm quite glad she did it because I was having the same issue. And I was like, nothing is, I'm doing nothing wrong with this plant. Why does it keep coming up with holes when it's growing? Is it because there's a pest? Is it something like that? But apparently I'm just like, oh, I'm glad you posted that because I'm having exactly the same problem. So, uh, but this gives you a notion. So a lot of the times you might get some self-watering pots for pond that are all in one basically there's a little net at the bottom there's the the bubble that goes up and down and let me see if i can bring one up and show you so this is a propagation of the burly marks variegata but you can see there's that little bubble that goes up and down and hopefully that's being picked up from the camera there you go and you can see if i'm tilting the water you should be able to see that level going up and down as well because obviously it's got a little uh, polystyrene ball in there, which gives it its buoyancy, which I thought was kind of cool. Bambi weedo, so I think these things are cool. Um, but this, you cannot take, there's no internal pot to take out to do a flush every so often. So the only way you can do that is putting your hand over it and then tipping all the water out, flushing it, doing that a few times. It's a bit of a pain. In hindsight, yes, these were cheap, cheaper than the ones that might have a removable insert where the pond would sit in but those do make flushing a bit easier. So in hindsight, I probably would have gone with that, knowing what I know now, purely because it's worth that extra bit of money to just to save you that issue basically there. Right, let me put this down and we'll keep talking. But what you can do is Jimmy rig it myself. So this is uh, just a clear plastic cup. It's got drainage holes. And this is another bit of a cup where the water will sit in there. And this makes it a lot easier then because I can just take this out, flush it, because that's another thing that you need to be aware of, especially if you're working with pond. Yes, it's not as temperamental as Lekka is, where you need to be flushing quite frequently. With my plants in pond, I will flush them every fourth watering, fourth or fifth watering. I will just run some fresh water through it, let it go through, let it go through. And for that week, especially if they've got a reservoir of water at the bottom, for that watering, I will leave clear water. I'll clean up the reservoir as well, because usually you get that dust that settles from the pond. 
at the bottom, I will clean that out and have clean water sitting at the bottom for that watering. And then after that, I'll bring back the nutrient solution that I would normally use, which in my case is liquid gold leaf. But yeah, that's another thing to just bear in mind with pond. As we're on the subject of pond, let me just mention one final thing and I'll close the pond subject, is when you're first getting a plant and the plant might be in soil, what you would want to do, and what this is what I do, is remove as much of the soil as possible. And I know there's contradicting kind of information on there. This is what I do. It might work for you, might not work for you. Um, but remove as much of the soil as possible and then put it into a pond media. Usually I'd like to use a plastic cup if I can, just because I want to see that those roots are growing before I move it into an opaque container. But what you want to be doing is not putting it straight into a water reservoir. You want to be watering this the same way that you would with soil. So if you were planning on watering that plant once a week or checking for moisture and then watering it, and then just flushing it through with water, you would do the same thing. You would just run it through as if it was a regular pot and just run it through with water until it starts dripping at the bottom, basically. And that's what you would do I would say for at least two or three months, generally speaking. And then at that point, when you've started seeing those roots come through, then you'd put it into an opaque container, especially if you're seeing that the roots are going healthy or putting a water reservoir at the bottom. That's the point where you want to be doing it. And this is specifically for plants that have been grown in soil in order to transition over to pond. And I'm pretty sure the pond website, Let's Choose a Pond, does also mention this, that it does need to be kind of watered like that for a while and then kind of moved into a self-watering container, not immediately. There is one exception to this rule, is if you've water propagated whatever plant it is, and it's pretty much got water roots, that one can go into pond, I have found, nine times out of 10, I think, or even 10 times out of 10, that can go into pond, and it can go into a water reservoir straight away because the roots are already acclimated. The point that I was making before is more specifically transitioning from a soil media to the Lechuza Pond media, basically, or whatever DIY version of it you might have as well. It's not just Lechuza Pond, obviously that's a brand, but yeah. The other question that I get a lot of the times is, what happens with all the soil mix if it's coming in from the drainage holes? What I like to use is, I'm trying to show this, you sometimes get like a plastic mesh that you get maybe vegetables or fruits in, or maybe uh, these are some reusable vegetable bags from the supermarket. And I cut it up and I put it on the inside covering the holes. And this is probably not going to show up great on the video, but you can kind of see what I've done there is I've covered up most of the holes. Then you'd put the soil in and then that just creates that kind of fine mesh that happens there. You might need to experiment. I'm not using this one as much anymore because the holes are a bit too close together in terms of the mesh. So it tends to keep the water in. I need to physically shake the pot to get all the water that's sitting on top of that mesh. A slightly wider net would be better, but experiment. Trial and error with that one and you'll find what works for you and you'll find that kind of mesh that works for you. And it's also to a certain point as well, you're reusing some plastic. The one thing I will say, and again, I can't remember whose video this was on YouTube a while ago, and they were worried because there was this weird growth that was coming out of the out of the drainage holes. And essentially what it was is they put something like this in and there was a really chunky like root that was coming in through this and it was pushing soil and it was pushing this and it was just like, what is this? And it's just like, when they unpotted it, they were just like, oh, it was this thing. So just bear that in mind. There's another thing as well to remember with these mesh nets, sometimes depending on how tight they are, you might still need to lift up your plant an occasion to see if it's root bound because this makes it exceptionally hard for roots to escape out of the drainage holes. Uh, and then you might be jogged to think, oh, 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 there's roots coming out of the drainage pole holes. It doesn't always mean it's root bound, by the way, but that's usually a good sign that most people will check and go, oh, yes it is, or no, it isn't. This can block that from happening. So you might still need to remember to check on your roots every so often. The other thing is, and I've got a lot of flack for this for a while now, but using something like a moisture meter, it doesn't cost an awful lot of money. I think I've got this link down below as well in the description. But using a moisture meter, I would say I've tried both 
the one with the one prong and the one with the two prongs. I prefer the one with the one prong. I would assume it's slightly less accurate than the one with the two prongs, but this is a lot easier to stick in the soil. The one with the two prongs, especially if you're shoving it into soil with like monstera roots or something that's got very chunky roots, it can give you false readings. The thing to remember about moisture meters is if you've got a pot, take a meter reading from here, then move it to another bit of the pot, then take a meter reading there and take to another part of the pot and then take a meter reading there and average out because one bit might be particularly dry and give you a dry reading, another bit might be sapping and give you a bit of a very wet reading. So just bear that in mind and judge accordingly. If you see that all the readings are showing that it needs water, water, if not, give it some time. As I said, I get a lot of flack for this because they're not always 100%. But my answer to that is, if you don't know, you don't know. If you're just starting to deal with plants now and you're a bit worried about all of these things of underwatering or overwatering or any of these things, this is a very handy little tool in the beginning just to get you used to it. Yes, over time, you'll probably be able to look at your pot, lift your pot, feel and get an idea when you get into a rhythm of how often a plant generally wants to be watered as to when you should be watering. But until then, this is good. And to be honest, many, many years later, I am still using this on occasion when I'm just like, oh, I'm not sure. I will say the disadvantage of pond for me is that I can no longer use my crutch. <laughs> and it can be quite tricky to see when a when pond has fully dried out because everybody was just like, oh, if you're doing it in pond, you need to make sure that it's fully dry before you flush it with water. And I'm just like, <laughs> because what you will get is drying at the top, but then it's still got moisture at the bottom. Another reason why I like to have clear containers because then I can kind of see if there's any condensation on the inside, it means that at least down here, there's still some moisture where the roots might be, but up here is a bit drier, that's fine. Now, the other thing to bear in mind, and I've talked about this on previous videos as well, is roots need to breathe. So a chunky arid soil mix, something like pond, something like liquor, they're good because it gives a lot of air. They need to breathe. So if you put in something really compact and then you water it and that water then acts a bit with the soil that's really compact, acts a bit like cement, those roots are not breathing. That's an issue basically. So bear that in mind as well. The other thing to note is the slightly fussier plants. And I'm looking at the entire Calathea family and sometimes the ferns as well. Now, they'll get the crisping on the edges. And the reason for that is as the water is being sucked up into the plant, it will deposit minerals at the edges of the leaves. And that is, for instance, if you're using tap water, by the way, it won't kill your plants. It just makes it maybe a bit unsightly if you're not, if you want to have completely pristine leaves, which arguably with a calathea can be quite a challenge. And the reason why that crispiness is happening is because there's salts in kind of most tap waters in order to make it safe for us to drink, but it's not the same as rainwater without any chemicals coming in it and watering it in nature. So, and obviously, by the way, in nature, have a look at some Calathea pictures in nature or even some botanical gardens. They've got crisping on them. But uh, I don't understand this fascination with people wanting leaves to be absolutely pristine. They're not in nature either. It's fine. It gives your plant a bit of character. It's, yeah, anyway, I'm not gonna go, not gonna dive into the, the topic of aesthetics too, too much. But with that one, you could use filtered water, you could use, if you really wanna go over the top, you can do reverse osmosis water, especially if you've got fish tanks and you produce your own RO water, that might be an option. There's some people that buy distilled water. Uh, I am not, like, I don't fully understand if you're kind of, enjoying nature, why you would want to be using a whole bunch of single-use plastic to buy that distilled water in to water one plant. It, it kind of doesn't sit well with me. But up to you, it's your decision to make, basically. But yeah, experiment with different waters. I can tell you now, every single plant in this conservatory and in the house generally is on tap water, except there is one exception that I still use RO water for which is carnivorous plants. They tend to really suffer quite severely from what I've heard. I've never experienced it because I've never watered them with tap water, but apparently they can get significant damage from the chemicals in the tap water. So with them, I will just use some reverse osmosis water. Another smart way of 
utilizing tap water if you want it to kind of be removing some of those harsher chemicals like the chlorines. And this might only be suitable in the UK. I think Liquid Gold Leaf, and I have got it linked down below as well, does ship worldwide now. But Liquid Gold Leaf, at least in my experience, it also kind of removes some of those salts from that water. So if you really want to be doing that, adding a tiny bit, and I kind of do the usual method of fertilizing very often, but very, very weakly, it can kind of help to remove some of those salts. And I've actually had some good experiences, even with my calatheas that are fussy. So that gives you a good indication there. And I think I want to wrap everything up with water propagations. Now with water propagations, most of us will try to do water propagations in a while. And I know everybody and their mum will say this, but if you can change that water frequently, there are a couple of exceptions, but generally, even if you find it too much of a drudgery to do it daily or every couple of days, do it at least once a week. Dump out the entire water from the vessel that you're propagating and put some fresh water in there. A couple of exceptions here. One would be if you've got something like a pothos cutting in there because that's releasing some of the hormones in there that will stimulate, that will help stimulate some root growth and the other cuttings that you might have in there. And if you want to keep that in there, maybe leave it for two weeks before you kind of change it over. But the reason why you should be changing over water and you're seeing the really kind of extreme water propagators putting things like a bubbling device that you might get in an aquarium in their water propagations is because they're reintroducing oxygen. If you think about what I was mentioning a moment ago, roots need oxygen. If it's in a fully water solution, it's taking the, the oxygen from the H2O. But there is a point when that water stagnates for a while, that oxygen becomes less available within that water. So refreshing that water will just mean that you'll be injecting more oxygen again into that vessel when it's propagating. The only other exception again would be if you're then starting to use, and I will use liquid gold leaf, if you're using, um, is it BioThrive? SuperThrive, that's the one. <laughs> if you're using anything like that that's in kind of a semi-hydro solution in your water propagations, and the thing to remember with that one is wait until you've got some decent sized roots within the water before you start adding that solution. And arguably only really do that if you're going to keep it in water indefinitely. If you're going to move it into another growing media, just move it into another growing media and fertilize it in there basically. But if you're doing that, then obviously don't change the water quite as frequently, but you still do need to do a water change. And you also need to do a water change, like I was mentioning earlier on, of every so often of just giving pure water rather than water with um, fertilizer within it. But yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say. This is a topic that I've been thinking of for a while. And I'm just like, oh, and I must talk about that. And I must talk about that because I wanted to, to do an overall one where I talk about loads of different things when it comes to watering. And I'm pretty sure I've probably forgotten something and I will kick myself afterwards. <laughs> but anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I haven't bored you to death. And I know a lot of people would like to see more videos when I'm showing plants. I showed a couple of plants. Hopefully that was enough. I do show more when I'm doing the review series. But with this one, it's hopefully more of an informational one and a bit more of a chat with me anyway. So yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.